the budget and stop the crime. They, uh, I, was, I, I know this because I went door knocking with Jamil, and he wouldn't stop. Even when the lights went out, it was very dark outside. He kept pounding on doors, pounding on doors. They said, Jamil, it's 9.45. You've got to stop knocking on doors. He said, just one more. Lights were out on this house. He bangs the door. The lights go on. Babies start screaming. <laughs> Lady opens the door, and she says, you're in big trouble, sir. I've got triplets that you just woke up, and my husband is a world champion weightlifter. He's, you wait right here. He just wants to come and have a word with you. And Jamil said, that won't be necessary. Just tell him that the local liberal candidate dropped by to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of hope among those people in Durham for Jamil for the future, but a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, fear and concern about the present. A lot of people feel like they, even though we were on their doorstep, that they were a long way from home. They say they don't recognize the country after eight years of Justin Trudeau with his inflationary debt and taxes driving up the cost of everything, with their f local food banks overflowing, the cost of housing having doubled. I knocked on the door of one 76-year-old ret retired trucker. And he, despite being a big, burly, bearded, strong man, was literally in tears. He had just learned that he was losing his home. He had, had to call his daughter to ask if he could live in her basement. And even with that change, he wasn't sure how he was going to pay for groceries. So what's he supposed to do? He's 76 years old. He cannot drive a truck. His old back won't take it anymore. What's more, it is fundamentally unjust that a man that drove a truck for a half a century bringing the essentials to our kitchen tables cannot put food on his kitchen table. But that is the tragic reality after eight years of Justin Trudeau and the NDP. Printing $600 billion of cash caused a massive inflationary crisis that continues to this day. A crisis that has driven food prices up faster than at any time in 40 years, that has sent 2 million people every month to a food bank, including 50 at the Gage Town base. 50 members our armed forces can't feed themselves. One in 10 Tor Torontonians are now going to a food bank. Unimaginable num numbers. Last week, Montreal police had to be called in because people were literally fighting over the scraps of food that were left at one of their food banks. There's been a 600% increase in demand for the University of Western Ontario's food centre. Uh, this at a time when scurvy is making a comeback because our people cannot afford to feed themselves with Justin Trudeau and the NDP taxing the farmers who produce the food, and the truckers who ship the food and therefore all who buy the food. And then there's housing. After eight years of Trudeau, housing costs have doubled. The rent has doubled, mortgage payments and down payments needed to buy the average home have all doubled. This after he put in place an $89 billion program he said would make housing more affordable. He didn't build homes. He built more bureaucracy. Last year, we built fewer homes in Canada than we did in 1972, even though our population has almost doubled in that, in that same time period. And this is not a global phenomenon. He cannot blame the rest of the world for this hell, this housing hell. This is a homegrown problem. We know that by looking at the facts. Housing costs have grown 40% faster than incomes under Trudeau. That is the second biggest gap of the almost 40 OECD nations. Vancouver is now the third most overpriced housing market in the world, worse than Singapore, a country that is an island with 2,000 times more people per square kilometer than Canada. More expensive than New York City, London, England, and countless other major centers with more people, less land, and more money. After eight years of Justin Trudeau, people are spilling over into tent cities. Halifax now has 30 homeless encampments. Halifax, quaint, beautiful, historical 
Halifax with homeless people all over the streets. This is a hell we could not have imagined eight years ago. In fact, of all the warnings we made about Justin Trudeau that the media decried as partisanship, we never even came close to claiming he would do the things that he has now in reality done. We were far, far too generous towards him in our interpretation of what would happen to this country under eight years of his socialist NDP policies. And then there's economic growth. We have had the worst economic growth per person in the G7. The worst. In fact, our GDP per person, our income per person in Canada is lower than it was five years ago. That has not happened since the Great Depression to put it into context. And then crime and chaos, drugs and disorder have been unleashed on our streets with a 100% increase in gang-related homicides, a 100% increase in gun crimes after he targeted the hunting rifles of Grandpa Joe and the sport shooting property of law-abiding uh, uh, sport shooters. He has actually doubled the number of gun crimes. Carjackings up 100%. There's a car stolen every 40 minutes in Toronto. In Toronto alone, cars that are then shipped off to the federally run port, the federally run port, where they're, where they're seamlessly put on ships and sent off to the Middle East, to Europe, and Africa so that terrorists and organized criminals can profit from it. He makes these problems worse by wasting our money, $21 billion spent on consultants. That works out to $1,400 for every single family in Canada all with the support of the NDP, taking money from working class waitresses and unionized tradesmen to pay two or three thousand dollar a day consultants, the, uh, uh, taking from the have-nots to give to the have-yachts, and all with the support of the NDP along the way. And what is their solution now, in the midst of all this? Have they finally admitted the damage they've done? Have they stopped the, have they st are they trying to stop and extinguish the fire they started? No. They're pouring more fuel on the inflationary flames with a April Fool's Day carbon tax of 23%. A 23% increase on your gas, your heat, and your groceries. Because if you tax the farmer who makes the food, the trucker who ships the food, you tax all who buy the food. And now we know that it was all a lie. When Trudeau said you get back more in rebates, we have the numbers from the parliamentary budget officers uh, who says, and I quote, this is $2,943 and $43 for the, uh, $2,943 for the average Alberta family. That's $900 more than they get back in rebates. Saskatchewan families, on average, $2,618. That's $525 more than they get back in rebates. $1,750 for, for Manitoba, $502 more than they get back in rebates. $1,674 for Ontario, that's $627 more than they get back. Nova Scotia, $1,500 more in carbon tax, $1,500 in carbon tax, $500 more than they get back. $1,600 for Prince Edward Island, $500 more than they get back. $1,874 in Newfoundland and Labrador, $377 more than they get back. I go into this painful, excruciating detail to, to debunk the dangerous disinformation mouthed by the Prime Minister and repeated by the media. It is dangerous. You say, you, you think I'm exaggerating by dangerous? You know what's dangerous? Malnutrition is dangerous. And when we have a government and, and state-controlled media who are telling people they're getting more than they're paying when exactly the opposite is true, that means people in food banks. That means hungry stomachs uh, in our schools. That means people suffering that shouldn't be. And we need to call out and tell the truth. But we're, we're not going to put up with it anymore. We as common sense conservatives are saying no to Trudeau's 23% April Fool's Day uh, increase. We are saying spike the hike until we common sense conservatives can axe the tax. The good news is... Yeah. The good news is Canadians are good and decent people. They do not have to live like this. They should not have to give up 
on the things that we all used to take for granted, like affordable food and homes, all for the ego and incompetence of one man. Life was not like this before Justin Trudeau. It will not be like this after he is gone. We're going to replace the hurt he has caused with the hope that Canadians need. So now, today I'm announcing that I'm giving Trudeau one last chance to spike his hike. One last chance and only one more day. Today I'm announcing that if Trudeau does not declare today an end to his forthcoming tax increases on food, gas and heat, that we will introduce a motion of non-confidence in the Prime Minister. It will read that the House declare non-confidence in the Prime Minister and his costly government for increasing the carbon tax by 23% on April 1st as part of his plan to quadruple the tax while Canadians cannot afford to eat, heat, and house themselves and call for the House to be dissolved so Canadians can vote in a carbon tax election. election. And in that carbon tax election, there will be a very simple choice. On the one hand, you will have the carbon tax coalition of the NDP and Justin Trudeau, who take your money punish your work, tax your food, double your housing costs, and unleash crime and chaos in your community, or common sense conservatives who will axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. We have a common sense plan that will bring home lower prices by axing the carbon tax uh, and by capping spending and cutting waste to bring down the deficit, inflation, and interest rates. We will eliminate the waste in government, like the $60 million Arrive Can app, like the billion dollar green fund that only funds liberal insiders, like the $21 billion or $1,400 per family Trudeau is spending on consultants, outside consultants, high-priced consultants that cost you more. We will eliminate this waste and we will bring home fiscal sanity to fix the budget. We will also build the homes. After eight years of Trudeau housing, costs have doubled because we have the fewest homes per capita in the G7. Common sense conservatives will require cities permit 15% more home building as a condition of getting federal funds. Those that beat the target will get a bonus. Those that miss the target will pay a fine. That will mean that municipal bureaucracies get paid like realtors and builders. They get paid for the number of homes they build and sell. We want municipalities to get paid for the number of homes they permit. We're going to sell off 6,000 buildings and thousands of acres of federal land to build, build, build. We'll take the carbon tax off, which will reduce the cost of materials and transportation of those materials to build those homes. We will stop the crime. We will bring jail and not bail for repeat violent offenders. We will bring treatment and not more legalized and subsidized hard drugs to bring our loved ones home drug free. We will secure the border and lock up gun criminals and smugglers instead of targeting licensed law abiding, trained and tested sports shooters and hunters. We will do all of this to bring home and to bring hope to the Canadian people, the Canadian people who suffered so, so badly over the last eight years, who remember the country that they loved and the country in which they still believe. A country where hard work will once again pay off, where a trucker who d delivers us the goods for 50 years will be able to live a good and dignified retirement. A country where young couples will be able to plan a new home in which they can have beautiful babies and, and raise a wonderful future for themselves and their families. A, a, a future where our kids can walk safely on the streets, 
where families do not need to peer out their window to see if their car has been stolen or worse yet, leave their keys at the front door so that the thieves can simply take them as they please. A country that is proud of itself, proud of its history, proud of its heritage, and optimistic about its future. A country where the state is servant and not master with small government and big citizens. A